good afternoon and a warm welcome to our new series of Food for Sustainability Academy webinars. This time we have a session dedicated to understanding whether we can really reduce greenhouse gases emissions in ruminants. Um, to start this debate, we have invited three experts, which I truly thank for their support and availability to join us and share your views and research specifically to address the topic on tools for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in ruminants. I have the pleasure to be joined by Sheida Ozakan. Hi Sheida, a livestock systems and climate change expert at FAO. Welcome Sheida. I also have with me Davy Yanis Ruiz. He's a senior scientist at Station Experimental de Zaid also known by CSIC. Pleasure to have you here, David. And also uh, Coralia Manzanilla Peck. She is an assistant professor at the Center for Quantitative for Genetics and Genomics at Aarhus University, Denmark. Great to have you here, Coralia. I will be moderating this session. I am Claudia Costa. I coordinate the Food for Sustainability Academy, which is our hub dedicated to educational awareness raising and capacity building programs to, towards achieving food for sustainability missions on working towards the sustainable intensification of the agri-food as you know towards a more health and well-being. And just to frame our conversations here today let me just remind you that food for sustainability has a well-defined research agenda which cover the topics on circular economy, sustainable farming, territorial development through the promotion of ecosystem services and functional nutrition. With this in mind, livestock management is a fundamental piece for more sustainable farming systems, carbon mitigation and more nutrient rich food. And so to bring this webinar uh, to your presence, uh, we have a dedicated team. So I would like, first of all, to start with a big thanks to all the Food for Sustainability team. And I also would like to acknowledge the great work of Daniela Fonseca, which is our PhD in Sustainable Chemistry. Hello, Daniela. Yes, Daniela is there waving at us. Margarida Palma, our PhD in Microbiology. Hello, Margarida. Give us a wave. Hi, Rita Silva. She's a master's in microbiology. Hello, Rita. Hi, Rita. And of course, last but not least, Silvia Moreira, our food science PhD. Where is Silvia? Hello, Silvia. And finally, I would also like to acknowledge the dissemination support from BGI, Building Global Innovators, namely Gonzalo Amorim, the CEO, and Eduardo Monteiro the marketing manager. Thank you to all for making these sessions possible. Just before we start, um, some house rules uh, on how these sessions run. Let me remind you that we record the sessions for later viewing. We have a lot of requests to, to watch the sessions later on. So if you're not comfortable with the appearing in these webinars, I will ask you to remain with your cameras off. Also, um, these sessions are much more rich and, and uh, interesting if we can have your questions. So we definitely welcome questions. Questions will be uh, posted through Slido. And after each speaker's presentations, I will address the questions to our speaker. So you know that um, each speaker will have 15 minutes to present and we will allow for a five to 10 minutes Q&A after each presentation. And so let's start with Slido. So Sylvia has prepared a few questions for us um, to start um, uh, introducing uh, the topic. So you can join Slido at www.slido.com and in the hashtag box, just insert F for S Academy and you're on. Of course, this is always easier if you are on a PC. I don't know how you can do this if you are on your mobile phone, which most of you are, I believe. But surely with, you know, being so technology savvy, 
most of you can join us. Sylvia, are we ready for the first question? Or are people still joining in? OK, fantastic. So our first question wonders if you have an idea of how big are livestock greenhouse gases emissions. Are we talking about a tenth of all anthropogenic emissions? Are we talking about roughly a figure of a quarter? Or is it a value that is uh, somehow between um, these two? What is your opinion? I have to say that uh, the research we have made, um, the figures in the literature, they, they, they vary. Uh, so some authors even point to a higher figure. But I believe this is something that Coralia uh, has been working on. She has these figures on from the top of her head. So I'm quite sure that, that she will be able to give us more insights on these figures. And apparently we have here a winner. And I have to say that uh, according to Gerber and colleagues, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock account for 14.5% of all anthropogenic emissions. Indeed, it's quite a big number. In fact, so it, did, it just really shows that it's worthwhile uh, to look uh, into this, this topic. Thanks for voting. So next, do we have our next question? So we already know how big this problem is. So what are the major greenhouse gases produced by ruminants? So what are the three ones that have caught the attentions of scientists? Is it the methane, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide? Would it be methane, nitrous oxide and hydrofluorocarbons? Or is it methane, carbon dioxide, and hydrofluorocarbons? And I think this is the topic that David is well aware from his work on rumen microbiome and can also give us an overview of how these gases relate to, to ruminants, both directly and indirectly. Okay, so Fantastic. This seems to be a very consensual uh, answer. So this really shows that our audience is knowledgeable on the topic. Definitely, we are talking about methane, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. Thank you so much. Well done, audience. Fantastic. OK, donkey donkey, here we go. We have a last question. Let's see how knowledgeable. This is a more tricky one. Um, so of all climate related investments, and we are talking about an estimate of $122 billion for the last decade, for the last two decades, uh, what do you think is the percentage of in investments that went directly to livestock? And I can see Seda uh, smiling because she has, uh, worked a lot on, on the role of financial mechanisms to support uh, change. Um, and she has gathered a lot of scientific evidence on why we should be allocating more funds for livestock management for targets of wealth and climate mitigation, right? So let's check what our audience is saying. So Seda is our audience, right? I would say you agree. This is really still a very low level of investment for livestock. 2% is actually the number from the past two decades that uh, accounted for climate related investments. Great, fantastic. Many thanks for taking part in this very short brief quiz. I hope that this has opened your appetite for our topic today. Slido, you know, will be open throughout the question for you to pose your questions as and when you have a question for our uh, speaker or if you wish any clarification on, on, on the speaker's presentation. OK, so let me just give you a little bit more details about our experts and who we have here. So we have Seda Oskan and Seda is a livestock systems and climate change expert 
with over 15 years of experience in modeling environmental impacts of livestock production systems. Working at FAO, SEDA provides technical and policy support to member nations and international finance institutions in terms of quantification of greenhouse gas emissions, for improving inventories, and of course, for enhancing capacities. Shader is particularly interested in exploring integrated approach to ensure food and nutrition security in a changing climate world. And Seda will give us here a, a broad perspective from the policy and the investments towards redux reduction green greenhouse gases emissions in ruminants. Thanks for being here, uh, Seda. We also have David Yanes with us. Uh, David is a, a vet by training and has a PhD in animal nutrition from the University of Cordoba of course, Spain. After completing his PhD, he has worked for four years as research fellow and associated lecturer in animal nutrition at the University of Wales, specifically to develop molecular techniques to study the ruminal micro, micro, microbial ecosystem. Apologies for that. Currently, he leads a, a research team in CSIC, uh, and it works mainly in four areas. First one, study the rum, rumen, rumen microbial ecosystem to increase animal efficiency and resilience. Secondly, assessment of different plant-based feed additives in ruminant nutrition. Thirdly, development of tools to assess sustainability in ruminant livestock. And fourthly, David still has time to investigate nutritional means to decrease methane emissions for ruminants. David also participates in several international projects, namely he coordinates a Horizon Europe called uh, Re Livestock. He's also the Spanish representative for the Livestock Research Group of the Global uh, Research Alliance for Agriculture Greenhouses. And he also co-shares the International Research Network on Feeding and Nutrition. And David will be here talking about feeding strategies to reduce emissions in ruminants. Thanks for joining, uh, David. And we also have the pleasure to have with us Cor Coralia. Coralia was born in Mexico and she has a long standing interest um, in quantitative animal genetic and genomics, specifically in ruminants. She started the study uh, in agriculture engineering with a major in tropical anim animal uh, production. And then she followed with a master's in animal breeding, genetic and reproduction in the University of Chihuahua, after which uh, she worked as a researcher for five years at the National Institute of Agriculture, Livestock and Forestry Research, also in Mexico. Later on, she has gained a PhD in animal breeding and genetics from Wageningen University with a thesis titled Genetic Improvement for Feed Intake and Methane Emissions in Cattle. Since uh, um, 2018, she's also an assistant professor at Aarhus University in Denmark, and she, where she has been focused on understanding the genetic background of methane emissions, specifically in their uh, cattle, and this connection with feed efficiency and productivity traits, specifically to identify a suitable phenotype to include as uh, in the future um, as a selection obje objective in terms of breeding. And Corelia will be showing us that it's actually possible to breed for efficiency and low methane with the emissions. Thank you all for being here. So now that we know our our experts, I have the pleasure to hand the floor to Seda. Seda will be a pleasure to hear your presentation. Um, thank you, Claudia. Um, I think just my presentation is coming up. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, perfect. Great. Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Claudia, for the organization and for introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as mentioned, as mentioned by Claudia, I'll be talking from a perspective from policy and investments today. 
Um, and, and, and with this, actually, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, co-authors and Motta and Felix Tayyad, who contributed to this presentation as well. Um, so I just want to start with telling you a little bit about the limited budget the world has um, to keep the global warming under 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. And the choices of what to spend it on should be based on benefits we get from it, right? And basically, um, with this, I just want to tell you a little bit about what do we get from a ton of CO2 equivalent emissions in terms of money, uh, jobs, food, and nutrition. So if you invest invest in it, sorry, this is. So if you invested in agriculture, a ton of CO2 emissions here in this part of the bar chart generates about 600 US dollars in GDP on average at global level. While it provides more than 2000 US dollars when invested in other sectors, so it's such as industries and services, for example. When you look at employment, a ton of CO2 generates twice as many jobs uh, when spent in agriculture compared to other sectors. And finally, only when invested in agriculture can CO2 generate food and nutrients, with livestock in particular contributing or accounting for about 40% of the protein produced per ton of CO2. So it's, it's clear that the um, climate targets, achieving climate targets, should not or cannot be on at the expense of uh, food security and livelihoods. Therefore, we need to allocate a certain greenhouse gas emission budget to the livestock sector, given its contribution to nutrition, employment, and livelihoods. Unlike other types of businesses, when farmers drop out, they usually don't come back to the activity later. The emissions from livestock sector are set significant at 14.5%. Um, we have just seen in the poll um, that the global figure um, from a livestock, uh, sorry, life cycle assessment perspective, not the direct emissions, uh, which are much less. Um, but the emissions are definitely significant, but they can also be reduced, avoided, or um, offset. And livestock is not part of the solution, not just part of the problem, but it's also part of the um, solution and how livestock are key to 400 million poor livestock keepers, key to food and nutrition security, and there's certainly gr growing demand for animal source food uh, in parts of the world. Those who are most vulnerable to climate change are farmers in low to middle income countries. So there is an untapped potential to improve their resilience, um, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions through feeding, breeding, pasture management, etc. And you're going to hear more about it from David and um, Corelia as well. And uh, not to, just also not to really um, and I can't just not mention this. Some emissions are just unavoidable. So we can't um, reduce uh, emissions altogether to zero. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm referring to the enteric methane or biogenic methane here. But we can also um, reduce emissions by basically tapping into the production efficiency. And in this map, you can see there are six different um, case studies conducted, and it shows um, the potential to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, absolute emissions, in parts of the world by um, simple um, interventions. So in the orange part, for example, in the Western to Central Africa, uh, by improving feed quality, um, grazing management, health and husbandry, for example, you can reduce the emissions by about 41%. Um, and in a recent study there's also um, the, a, a reporting on that the emissions intensity is reducing for most livestock categories globally in the past two decades mainly because of the protein production efficiency improvements and the IPCC2 methodology being emphasized so this this letter effort to use IPCC2 having much greater mitigation effect than the demand side efforts. So cut down the meat or not, because you can actually, you can do more by um, improving the methodologies. Therefore, it should also be prioritized in a few developing countries. And but I mentioned tier, tier approaches. What are they for those who are not familiar? Um, there are mainly tier, tier, three, three tier approaches um, that published by the IPCC. Um, and tier one being the most basic, tier two being intermediate, and tier three being the most advanced. In a tier one approach, you basically calculate the multiplied number of animals by the emissions per animal. 
Uh, that's a fixed factor that doesn't change over time. Um, therefore, as you can imagine, if you're using this method, the only way to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the livestock, livestock sector would be reducing the number of animals. As opposed to tier two approach, where you have the number of animals, you multiply it by the intake per animal and the emissions per intake, but the intake per animal are actually calculated from productivity gains, productivity changes that also changes over time. So you can capture the production efficiency if you're using tier two approach. That's how important it is. And um, so how to align with Paris Agreement? Livestock in, this is, this is a map of uh, 148 countries that submitted new or updated nationally determined contributions uh, as of November 2021. And it's, it shows um, which countries are actually targeting livestock uh, in, in the, for mitigation and adaptation uh, targets. Um, and, and you can see from, from this, the 34 to 36% of the countries include livestock mitigation or adaptation measures. And, and the majority also refers to uh, conditional and unconditional targets, which means that if there are conditional targets, um, these are basically conditional on uh, international support. And mitigation and adaptation priorities include, um, some are also overlapping like feed management, uh, manure management, or civil pastoralism. But you can see it's only the one tenth of the countries mentioning it. So there's clearly a gap in um, capacities, uh, awareness, and also um, technical uh, aspects. And to, 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 to capture that, we looked at um, how the animal health is or can be incorporated to national climate commitments. Uh, because currently only 63 countries use the U.S. approach, including 42 developed and 21 21 developing countries. And in Africa, there are only six countries using the U.S. approach, for example. And we looked at it from in this policy brief, uh, what is needed, what is needed to be able to incorporate animal health. But this can also be applied to other um, mitigation strategies, animal health being one, because it's also a win-win and no regret uh, solution uh, to reducing emissions while also improving food security. Uh, and we we um, we found that um, tier two calculations, at least tier two calculations, are needed. And there are clear data and MRV gaps. Uh, and in terms of data, we need animal numbers per category. Uh, or we need also the herd parameters to estimate these numbers, such as fertility, mortality, age at first calving. Um, and we need data on feed rations, such as digestibility, feed basket, composition, and protein content. They all, all need to be collected for different categories of animals. And as you can imagine, this is very, uh, very difficult to do. And that also explains why T2 methodology is lacking in, 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 in most countries. And there, there's also um, technical support needed. The capacity gaps require technical support to show the impact of technical interventions, such as vaccination campaigns, animal genetic resources, manure management. And we need a systems perspective. And that's mainly because like, one outstanding challenge that really concerns how the emissions from livestock sector are reported in national greenhouse gas inventories and included in NDCs. So, because countries report direct emissions at sector level. But livestock sector includes methane uh, from intake fermentation, that's a direct emission, um, methane and nitrous oxide from manure emissions, but also feed emissions, feed the emissions from feed production, processing, transport, energy use. They all reported under other categories, such as agricultural soils or energy sector. So when you have implemented interventions, you cannot really um, consider them in isolation at animal level as affecting only direct emissions. Um, for example, in the case of animal health, um, the, um, the supply chain emissions may diminish because you need fewer replacement animals or the changes in the res uh, feed ration, as opposed to the um, perhaps an improve increasing emissions at animal level. That's that's why it, uh, taking a systems perspective is is really important. And finally, enhanced awareness, and this includes tools tailored to specific country contexts. And oftentimes we see sometimes that we see that countries using tools or methods that are not necessarily capturing the specific uh, points, uh, perspectives of the country's livestock sector. And therefore, um, 
they, they are um, the, the tools are necessary that that capture the country's context. So, so when you look at six different, we have looked at um, six different uh, Sahelian countries NDCs, and what's common among them. So these are the countries on the left. There are mitigation targets that are conditional to international support. There's definitely need for capacity development, MRV mitigation options that are not very so that are not so clear or specific to the sector. Livestock co-benefits are missing, and despite its large share of agricultural emissions. And finally, livestock measures mainly on adaptation uh, and mitigation measures at animal productivity, modernization, patterning. Uh, they, they are also part of it, but like I said, they may not necessarily be 100% uh, relevant to the country's context, for the livestock sector in particular, of course. So some uh, investments are happening. So from that 2%, uh, of course, that, that, that there is an increasing um, trend in, in investments. And we're seeing it in the uh, International Finance Institutes investing more and more and, and uh, being World Bank, for example, or IFAD. And this is a project um, we assessed um, as a technical support to IFAD. That's, a twin, um, that's, that's called um, rege uh, Regeneration of Landscapes and Livelihoods in Lesotho. It's a $46 million uh, dollars, US dollars project focusing on small remnants, changing resource use practices, reduction of environmental degradation, improved livelihoods, and establishment of um, facilities and landscape regeneration. And uh, we looked at it, we looked at its um, environmental impact. So the, the, this part is showing the total emissions, reducing by about 7%. Uh, emissions intensities, that's emissions per unit of protein, uh, reducing by about 30%. Protein production is increasing by about 40%, while feed intake is not changing significantly. So it's actually even reducing um, likely. So it is possible through these investments to reduce not only emissions intensities, but also absolute emissions while com not compromising the food security. And for perhaps one final thing is that that's of, that often, often also comes up, carbon sequestration and its potential to offset e emissions. And I've, I've come across this paper from Carter et al, um, looking at rethinking or undoing uh, the carbon equivalents, uh, because we're kind of equating them, equating carbon in emissions to carbon in removals may undermine the efforts to reduce emissions. And they, they call it what's, um, what's called a mitigation deterrence. Um, and so are they really equal? Is, is, is a ton in carbon, uh, is a ton of carbon in sinks equal um, to carbon in emissions? Um, so we actually might need separate objectives, targets for removals and objectives for emission reductions that that might actually work better in that case. Because basically um, carbon in soils and biotic forms uh, are, are different. Um, and so you might also see um, that this, this might allow fossil fuel emissions to be offset uh, if, if you're equating them by increases in biological carbon sequestration. Because fossil fuel, um, uh, fossil carbon, sorry, fossil carbon sinks are permanent if left unused, while biotic carbon is part of the dynamic carbon cycle in the atmosphere. And methane uh, from ruminants is a good example of this because methane belched by the ruminants remains in the atmosphere for about 10 years. And it's, it's fixed then uh, by plant th plants through photosynthesis. So it does not add additional carbon to the atmosphere, but it is very important to reduce it to save time and in the short term. As opposed to carbon dioxide from fossil fuels that releases new carbon into, into the atmosphere and it remains trapped for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So when we equate the carbon in fossil and biotic forms, is mitigation really achieved by reduced fossil fuel emissions or increased biotic sequestration then? So perhaps shifting the burden of mitigation from energy sector. So Perhaps this is a useful abstraction, but it's 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 perhaps also a poor guide in the design of policy, climate policy, where different mitigation options and their impact vary in space and time. And obviously, technologies, socioeconomic context, climate change temporalities—they're not the same. 
And finally, I want to leave you um, with this. This is uh, a, a GCF, Green Climate Fund, that approved the preparation funding to support the development of a regional public-private sector program for Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. So it was uh, launched at 20, um, it, COP26 uh, and building basically on the participating countries' adaptation needs as expressed in their um, nationally determined contributions. And with this, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any any questions you might have. Great to say that. Thank you so much for a, such a comprehensive um, uh, presentation. Very interesting uh, uh, questions that you raise in terms of uh, uh, how our countries are the, adhering to the policies. You know the the measures that we are using, the financial instruments, all the complexities. Uh, that these managements and then these interventions have. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, while Sylvia puts our slide up, I have here a couple of questions for you just to kick off the, the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I think you pointed during your presentation that um, um, FAO, FAO works point, points to a uh, clear linkage between animal health and greenhouse gases emissions, although uh, from the 150 countries that have signed the climate mitigation agreement, you mentioned that only 34%, you know, include livestock mitigation measures in their in their actions. And you also stress that you know animal health is a win-win situation. So my question is, if animal health has such a direct impact on farmers' revenue and also on climate, why are these measures being more adopted? What do you think are the main barriers that we just look at animal health for as a way for climate mitigation? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, animal health is, I think it, it is being targeted, and but, it, but I guess you have to look at it from different levels, different scales. So from a farmer's perspective, also from different um, context in developed or developing countries, that's also a different, um, that there will be a different answer. But a farmer would need to get money from treating their cows or preventing a disease. If that's not working out for them, they will they will basically slaughter the animal, right? But I, we're actually seeing quite uh, many um, in, uh, interventions in, in, in these investment projects, especially at national level. So vaccination programs, for example, improving animal health um, through improved veterinary services or facilities. These are, um, these are happening, but um, when they're happening at national level, they usually are part of these um, larger projects. And that's why we also emphasize the importance of being part of such projects to be able to really see how the um, animal health is targeted and how it can be captured. Uh, but why it's not being captured is another uh, question and that, that's, that probably requires a more elaborative response because um, to be able to capture the animal health in national climate commitments, countries need to use at least CO2 methodology. And CO2 methodology, as I mentioned, is very um, demanding in terms of data and uh, monitoring, um, measurement, reporting, and verification system as well, which most of the countries are also lacking, especially in the low to middle income countries. This is this is really missing, um, and that's why um, that's why I just can't emphasize enough the um, the need to improve, or enhance awareness and capacity at national level, um, so that they can be taken up and and more countries move to tier two approach. But even then, there are still limitations. So tier three is definitely better, but uh, I guess that's that's a one step by step um, uh, perspective. Say that I would love to have just a webinar on how you know the uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change really measures greenhouse gas emissions tier one, tier two, and tier three. It's very, very, very interesting, but we don't have time for that. But this found um, um, speaks directly with governments in how to to educate them on these methodologies because they are very complex. And um, uh, so, so, how is the process? Um, how does it, the communication works between the implementations that you recommend and actual people and governments knowing that they they have this new methodology they should be following and that has implications with how they measure, how they collect information, you know, what incentives they have in place to ensure that farmers, how does it work just out of curiosity? 
Um, the, and this is the national determined contributions. Uh, countries report to UNFCCC every five years, and that's where they report their uh, national targets for mitigation and adaptation measures as well. Um, and uh, when they do that, they use um, that's basically for all sectors, not just livestock and agriculture, basically, but it's all sectors. And when they do that, they report only the direct emissions. And um, so basically, they need to use a tool, a model, uh, to be able to um, to be able to report, uh, quantify uh, expected impacts of such interventions. So they come up with interventions that are. Uh, supposedly relevant for, for the country context. And then they use two tools to be able to calculate the impacts of, of these interventions. But what, what we have seen also in, in, in some of in some one of the, these six um, Sahelian countries, and in, I think Cameroon recently I came across that the countries may not always use the relevant tools. And when they do that, then um, then the, the mitigation, then they can't, they cannot uh, calculate, quantify the impact of the intervention uh, for the livestock sector, or um, they are only very limited to what this tool can provide them. Um, because we have seen fat supplementation, for example, being a, a mitigation uh, uh, strategy in a pastoralist uh, con context, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's that's only what that tool can do. If you're not using the right tool, then you're you might be just uh, coming up with um, you might come up with solutions that are not um, hundred percent relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but also for the um, animal health, I, I will be presenting the the brief in a, in another another conference. Perhaps that that I can also share the link for you. And and if there there's anyone who's interested, they can also join that. That's a, there's a there's a uh, an online, online workshop on um, sheep welfare and sustainability in okay, May, and um, you will be, be welcome to join that. Okay, thank you, Seda, for such a comprehensive answer. And we have some more practical questions from our audience. So then the first one, is there any practical tips for farmers who want to reduce their animals' greenhouse gas emissions? So what could you advise farmers that are worried with their animal emissions? I think this is also a question that um, that deserves an answer from different angles. And and also different, I think this is different in, if you're in a diff developed country as opposed to a developing country. It's different uh, depending on uh, your whether your targets are conditional or unconditional at the national level. But for, uh, I mean, for, there are so many uh, mitigation uh, interventions, mitigation strategies. Always starting, perhaps I think I'll, I, I, it's best that I leave it to, to David and, and Corelia because they will be touching on breeding and um, and feeding strategies. Do you but, have a favorite, uh, Seda? <laughs> I don't have a favorite, <laughs> but I am I'm, I'm actually a fan of looking at that from a systems perspective. So any strategy may uh, reduce the emissions or one particular emission, uh, but it, if it is also increasing the other emissions or total emissions at the system level, then it, it probably requires a, a more um, detailed approach or a more attention. Uh, so I, I don't have a favorite, but uh, I mean, feeding, breeding, animal health, they are uh, manure management. So we look at it from three different perspectives, herd level, feed level, and manure level. Uh, and um, there are so many ways of doing doing that. But I think for, for me, that that I, I need to, what I need to em emphasize is looking at it from, uh, from, from the supply chain or value chain level, not only at animal level or farm level. Okay, so it's uh, integrating all the different approaches. And yeah. another question from the consumers. What can we consumers do um, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Do, shall we change our diet? Shall we go for different uh, types of, of meats? Any <laughs> tips on this? <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Perhaps not my expertise area in particular, but I have mentioned in one of my slides that if you're using T2 approach, um, that that's because you're improving your methodology. That has more significant impact than cutting down the meat. Um, but having said that, I don't mean 
that uh, there are parts of the world that are not consuming so, many, so much meat. So the, the Western world, so we are perhaps uh, consuming more meat than, than we need. Uh, but I guess, again, my system's perspective comes in. If you're not eating that, uh, what are you eating? What are you replacing it with? Um, so you're replacing it with something that, that is perhaps associated with higher greenhouse gas emissions or land use change. It's com is it coming from abroad? Like, what is, what is it? And I think it's also, it's not just about the food. It's also about how you live. Are you, are you always driving? Um, or, you know, what, what, are you, what are you wearing? Are you wearing cotton? cotton? And, and that, that, that are also, I think, part of, part of this answer. So I, don't, I don't think there's really one answer to that, but there's definitely one aspect that we need to think about. The parts of the world is still uh, in need of animal source food. And there is quite an increasing demand for, for, for them to, um, to, to, um, to have more uh, animal source food. And that also means the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions on that part of the world are, are likely to increase. Great, uh, Sebas. Thank you so much. I'm going to, I still have two questions, but I'm just concerned about the, the time. I will ask Silvia mm -hmm. to leave these two questions. I will try to address them at the end. I just don't want to, to the other uh, speakers to run out of time. So, Seda, thank you so much for your thank you. uh, participation. It was a pleasure. I will now ask David to come to the floor and start sharing his presentation. David, hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. Let's see if this works. We see your presentation in presentation mode. Off you go, David. Thank you. OK, thank you, Claudia. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, webinar. And um, yeah, as it was uh, said before, I'm going to um, go into uh, something uh, more specific. Uh, and, and the introduction uh, in the previous talk was um, was quite good to put things in in context. I'm going to be concentrated on uh, emissions of um, enteric methane uh, from ruminants uh, and how we can reduce those emissions using uh, feeding strategies. I only got 15 minutes, so I'm not going to go into much detail. But um, I think it's uh, probably <clears throat> important to uh, first explain where methane comes from. And methane is actually not produced by ruminants, but by uh, different microbes that they have in, in the rumen. Ruminants are herbivores that have the ability to uh, live on um, or just feed themselves on um, plant material. And this is thank you to a, a diverse and complex um, microbial ecosystem that they have in the rumen. Uh, which is comprised by bacteria, archaea, protozoa, and fungi, and, and they can get the energy source, BFAs, and protein source, microbial protein, as a result of the activity of those uh, microbes. But one of the byproducts of that fermentation is methane, uh, and, and then uh, it's something the, the evolution has put there, and then we, we can uh, try to reduce uh, that part of, uh, of the byproduct of the fermentation, but obviously we cannot eliminate that part of the fermentation uh, at all. Methane is produced as part of the um, anaerobic fermentation of uh, carbohydrates, and, and it's, that's basically because uh, the anaerobic fermentation uh, produces some elect um, hydrogen that has to be placed somewhere, and the way women uh, microbes uh, deal with that is just basically by saturating CO2 and producing uh, methane. If we could uh, open a little window here on the left-hand side of the, of the animal, what we could see would be something like this. So a very complex and diverse um, and active um, microbial ecosystem. Uh, what you can see there is just only uh, protozoa, which are the largest uh, microbes in the rumen, basically uh, colonizing and degrading, degrading um, plant material and, and then producing um, uh, producing the uh, nutrients that the animal use and also producing uh, methane. And this is important to consider because when, when we talk about feeding strategies, uh, not only to reduce methane, but for other purposes, sometimes we forget that we're dealing uh, not just only with ruminants, but we're dealing with microbes. And, and some of the strategies need to be um, considering uh, the microbial side of the, of the story. 
So today I'm going to just briefly touch some of the potential strategies that we can use to reduce enteric methane production. And uh, we could consider uh, like three main levels to uh, reduce enteric methane production. Uh, some could be applied to the herd, to the whole uh, farm. Some could be applied to uh, individual animal uh, treatment and related to the, the nutrition. And then a, a more specific level at the bottom could be applied directly on the rumen uh, microbiome. It's important to say that in, in some cases, uh, these um, strategies are a win-win situation, like uh, improving the animal health in the, in the herd. So normally when you decrease greenhouse gases, in this case, enteric methane, you uh, have also a benefit in terms of efficiency. And sometimes the people don't understand uh, this relationship. It's very important to, uh, to think that uh, in most cases, uh, um, both go hand in hand. So if we if we go to the herd level, and this is a uh, this is not a dietary or feeding strategy itself, it's more a, a efficiency um, a strategy in terms of uh, the longevity uh, of the animals. But I think it's important to consider because it's very basic in terms of the treatment. If we use a, a dairy farm as an example, uh, for instance, uh, we know that in in dairy systems uh, <clears throat> we need two years for the animal to uh, since it's born to be productive to. To, to happen. So first it's got a growing phase and then the animal gets uh, pregnant and then eventually starts a, a cycle of lactation The uh, last normally around one year, including the dry period. And then this cycle uh, is repeated as many times as the animal is in the, in the farm. I'm going to just try to use the... Yeah. So... Uh, it's important to consider here that during the, the first period, during the first two years, uh, those animals are eating, consuming inputs and producing methane, but are not producing any milk. And, and it's not until this point when animals, uh, ruminants are producing milk, uh, still producing methane, of course, because they're, uh, they're eating the, the diet. And the, the idea is to try to reduce, to dilute these emissions that are always there in the first two years and as many cycles of lactation as possible. So the longer we have the animals in the farm, the, the healthier they are, the more lactations they can be in the farm, uh, the less important is this per first part of, um, of the period. And this is achieved by incre in, um, increasing the health of the animals uh, when it's possible to also having an earlier period of, um, um, uh, of starting at the first lactation. Uh, and, and then having animals as, for as long as possible. So this is just an example of the numbers that you can get when you can have an earlier calving period and a lower cooling strategy, so less animal replaced in the farm because the animals last for longer. So the contribution of the replacement part of the young animals to the overall emissions of methane per kilogram of milk can go from 19, so below 10% of the overall farm to 33. So if we go around 2019, we are in a in a very good in a very good position. So this is just an example of how we can manage the farm to maximize uh, the inputs and and also minimize as much as possible the emissions of enteric methane. If we go to another example, uh, just based on the on the animal level, <clears throat> and this is very very basic, uh, it's just on on the uh, quality uh, of the diet. Uh, it's important to consider that uh, the energy that we animals have in, in the diet is considered the gross energy, but then from that initial energy to the net energy that the animal uses for either maintenance or production, milk, meat, exercise, um, growing, uh, there are losses of different uh, energies at different steps of the digestion and the metabolism. One of them being methane. So when the uh, gross energy is digested, then some of that energy is lost in feces, but then when that energy is metabolized, it's ready to be metabolized, there is some energy lost as urine and methane. And that energy represent, in methane represents from 2 to 12% of the initial gross energy in the diet. So um, diets that are of better quality would have a lower percentage of um, uh, loss of um, in form of methane. And this is very clearly seen in this in this graph. Basically, what we are plotting here is the digestibility of different diets from 40% to 85% at the bottom of the, of the graph. And on the left hand side, we can see the percentage of the initial gross energy that is lost as methane. So from 
two to seven eight percent. So it's very clear that the relationship is the uh, the higher the digestibility, the lower the percentage of the energy that we lost in in methane. We can uh, classify the feeds in different categories because we cannot pretend or we cannot uh, aim to have uh, all feeds to have a very high digestibility because by nature they're different. So we can have a, a kind of um, low medium quality forages and then the forages that are in, in the middle and then concentrates that normally have a high concentration, a high digestibility. So it's this yellow and gray area where we can initially make the improvement in the in digestibility of the, of the feed. And of course, uh, decrease the percentage of the energy lost as, as methane. And this is just to give you an example. Uh, uh, well, some of the information in, is in Spanish, but uh, I think that you can you can understand that. Basically, this is a, a an example of a nutrition value of um, grass silage, and we can have different qualities of grass silage from excellent to fifth. And so, uh, as you go down, then uh, the protein content is lower, and the digestibility is also is also lower. So the uh, the excellent quality has nearly seventy five percent of uh, uh, digestibility, while the the fifth, which is the worst uh, quality of grass silage, has around uh, 57 percentage of digestibility. So the difference in using those two extremes are that if we fed um, grass silage of uh, excellent quality, we are losing less than 4 percent of the uh, gross energy in, in form of methane, while if we are um, using the, the worst uh, grass silage, we are losing nearly 7% of the gross energy in form of methane. So the better the quality uh, of, the, of the diet, the, uh, the less um, energy is lost in form of methane. And this is uh, uh, related to um, what was discussed in the previous presentation. If we use a tier two or tier three uh, system to uh, estimate our emissions in, in a country or in a region or a system, we can capture the quality of the diet as one of the elements, and we can quantify uh, the improvements in a in a given uh, production system, which is uh, which is very important. So, second example uh, at the animal level, improving the quality of the diet is uh, is the um, is the main is the main element. Normally, in ruminants, this implies the use of good quality forages, which is the the feeds that are around uh, this area, and they have the larger uh, room uh, for uh, for improvement. Normally with concentrates, we normally have a very high uh, digestibility that does not leave much room uh, for such uh, improvement. OK, and now if we if we go for the for the third example, um, um, how we can uh, by dietary means trying to uh, reduce enteric methane production, we can directly target the rumen microbiome. I was, um, and I'm going to use the example of feed additives. So I was saying at the beginning that methane is not produced by um, ruminants, it's produced by um, uh, microbes called methanogenic archaea. And if we can modify the activity of those or some of those microbes, we can perhaps uh, achieve a, a good reduction on, on methane. This is just a, a table from a recent. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, work that we published in PNAS uh, last year on um, assessing different strategies uh, that we could uh, implement to uh, reduce greenhouse gases emission. And what we could see from the literature is that um, the use of methane inhibitors in terms of uh, dietary means is the, the one that represents the largest uh, uh, improvement, so the largest reduction on average around 30, 35 uh, percent of, uh, of reduction. So I'm going to give you uh, two examples of um, products that can, one of them can be uh, used uh, already in the market, but in different markets, but just two examples of um, the dietary modification of the rumen microbiome that are feasible at the moment. One is uh, Bovar, uh, which is a commercial product developed by DSM. Uh, the active compound is called 3 trinoxypropanol and it's been authorized by the European Food Safety uh, Agency. Uh, and uh, it claimed to reduce uh, around 30% of enteric methane. Uh, it's been approved now for uh, dairy systems. It has not been approved yet for um, meat systems. And it's uh, registered in the European Union, Switzerland, 
uh, Brazil, Chile, and maybe other countries. What is not clear is what is going to be the cost of uh, this compound, but I can explain <coughs> very um, briefly later on how this uh, this one works. The other example is um, uh, red algae, uh, asparagopsis, uh, either taxiformis or, or armata, which are uh, algae that grow in, in some uh, marine ecosystems, and they and in nature they have a, a high content of a compound called bromoform and other allogeneity compounds, but mainly bromoform, and they can um, this bromoform has also a direct impact on the uh, microbial fermentation, and uh, it's been shown to reduce uh, methane production up to eighty uh, percent. It's important to consider, uh, at least for nutritionists, that uh, they have different kind of uh, so at the moment categories uh, and uh, in the uh, dietary uh, legislation. So bovar is an additive, and at the moment bromo uh, asparagopsis is an ingredient of the diet, uh, which has a direct impact on the fermentation. So um, wh why these two additives uh, are so effective and why we can modify um, the microbial fermentation in an efficient way and in an ecosystem that is so complex and and diverse. And basically the reason is because uh, although some of these um, metabolic routes are very complex and also re redundant in, in, the same, in the sense that uh, different microbes can do the same function, uh, when it comes to producing methane, this is like more like a funnel. So uh, everything has to go through a certain metabolic route. And if we are able to block the uh, metabolic route, then we can reduce uh, methane production. There's no alternative way of the rumen to deal uh, with with this treatment. So basically, as I said before, methane is produced uh, from uh, by methanogenic archaea that basically they get energy from saturating CO2 into into hydrogen. And, and they do that with a um, complex and low metabolic route. But the, one of the last steps involves uh, uh, the methyl coenzyme M reductase, which has two subunits. And one of them is the methyl coenzyme M. And uh, the compound 3NOP, which is uh, the, the additive, uh, has been designed to be very similar in, 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 in the structure and also being able to uh, oxidize the um, active component of, of this enzyme and therefore inhibiting the activity uh, of archaea. So you can see here an example of how this um, compound can mimic uh, the presence of the natural uh, other element of the enzyme and basically blocking the activity of, of that enzyme and, and reducing the activity of methanogenic archaea. So this compound has been tested uh, through a series of experiments in, in different labs from very simple pure cultures work to in vitro uh, rumen uh, systems to sheep, dairy, and, and beef cattle, and the result is this uh, reduction of 30% um, uh, on, on methane. And as I said before, it's been approved for use in the European Union. The, the other example is um, Asparagopsis uh, red algae, and it's been shown that uh, using uh, in around 1% of organic matter, I forgot to say that the additive uh, bovara is uh, recommended to be used around 60 milligrams per kilogram of dye, so 60 ppm. Uh, so asparagopsis, uh, <clears throat> they can reduce up to 80-90% of the of the, um, of um, methane production, and basically uh, they, uh, the bromophone and other allogeneity compound interact with um, the two main enzymes of the of the archaea. That again are key enzymes for the uh, activity uh, in methane uh, production. So at the moment, this uh, strategy is uh, uh, attracting lots of interest. Uh, because uh, it's uh, well, it's a natural um, ingredient, uh, so it's an algae that uh, has been used already in in some in some countries as uh, part of uh, of the diet, and it's also been the technology to be to grow this algae in in vitro condition is also developing. So um, that can allow to a scaling upscaling uh, use of the of the um, of the additive. So yeah, that, that's that's all for me. So uh, just to, to conclude, uh, um, reducing enteric methane production is uh, is possible. We cannot completely inhibit it uh, in the long term, but we can we can achieve uh, reasonable levels of uh, of reduction. And there are different means to 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 achieve that. Some of them are complementary, uh, so they don't they can be additive, uh, and and we can uh, operate at, at herd, animal, and room microbial level to trying to work towards uh, the reduction of uh, enteric methane.
So thank you very much, and I'm, I'm very happy to to get any any questions you may have. Thank you, David. It was a, a great overview on how strategies to uh, that uh, at the farm level can be implemented. It was a very comprehensive overview. Thank you, thank you for for this. So I will take just your presentation a little bit further. So you have pointed that several interventions at the farm level can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And you mentioned, for example, long, longevity, animal diet, namely through improving diet and working with a cow microbiome. And you mentioned some, some additives and some ingredients. So from the farmer perspective and taking into consideration, for example, um, in terms of asparagostis, you mentioned the, 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 the costs and in terms of longevity, it will have implications on how farmers manage the farm. What, which one do you feel is the easiest entry point for farmers um, towards methane reduction? So let me rephrase it. Which of these options would be more accessible to farmers given you know, the entire, even economic context that we live at the moment? Feed digestibility, as simple as that. Uh, it's just, it's very simple, but um, especially forage digestibility, because uh, if if the farmer takes more care of the quality of the of the of the forage mainly and when i say quality i mean digestibility a uh, good content of protein uh, um, not too high e ndf or high digestibility of uh, the fiber uh, that's that's the, the main one in terms of uh, feeding strategies okay great so we we just tap into one of the questions from from the author uh, audience um so we can increase digestibility by using alternative forage species. So what forage species do you think are more adequate to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions? Do you have a specific? I, yeah, species? I don't think. Uh, of course, yeah, there are there are forages that are um, prone to reduce or to produce less methane. But my suggestion is not to focus on what forages are best for to reduce emissions, but what how we can improve the quality of the forages that we have available in in our region to reduce emissions because uh, you know i can go to a, a farmer here in um in south spain to tell him that you know grass silage is is great uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and he said yeah but here you know we don't get rain we don't we cannot grow grass uh, so uh we, we only use uh old hay and maybe um, um alfalfa hay so my suggestion is to on the range of forages that we have available in our region just to look after the quality so uh, get a forage that is harvested at the right time for the digestibility and a forage that is uh, conserved in the best way either as hay or, or silage okay so you you that you you take into consideration also the the indirect uh, emissions from uh, good quality forage so you, you you go further than just you know the direct implication and you have almost like a life cycle assessment of the feed that we are using uh, well well of course yeah that, that's important as well if we consider also fertilization and, and, and other aspects that also greatly contribute to the emissions of greenhouse gases but my, my point is that instead of uh, saying a uh, right, I should use maize instead of um, grass, or I should use alfalfa instead of um, oat hay. Uh, I, I think the point is that the forest that you have available in your region, because of your climatic conditions, you need to try to get the best quality possible of that forage. And that's the okay. first, you know, the very basic uh, first uh, feeding strategy I would suggest to farmers. And so on that point, what do you consider to be a high quality uh, diet and a low quality diet? Well, that's basically the digestibility. So anything below 50, 55, 60 percent is, uh, is low quality and anything above that is high quality. But again, I, I wouldn't simplify the equation uh, in only that sense, because in some areas, uh, the, the grass available or the forage available is what it is. So, um, you know, it's just a, within the margin of improvement that you have in, in, in your region or in your system, just trying to get the best possible. OK, thank you. Very um, clear answer. Thank you for that. So we have here two questions uh, that just move now, but it's on the on the, the, the additives and one 
asks whether these additives can be used in organic farming. I don't know if you have an answer for this. And whether we already have some, some knowledge about the long-term effects of these additives. Yeah, that, these are two very good questions. First one, as far as I know, I don't think these particular two additives I presented are registered for organic farming. Um, I'm, I'm sure there will be probably in the future, but not otherwise. There are all the additives that can be used in organic farming, but they are not specifically developed to reduce synthetic methane emissions. But these two, I don't think they are at the moment. And the second question is uh, um, the long term effect. The long term, yeah. Um, and this is something we don't know because they are new. So uh, there are um, trials that have lasted for months. But, and that's that's what we have and the at least in Europe the uh, the EU re regulation uh, requests uh, a minimum duration of uh, several weeks uh, but um to prove that the, uh, there is a consistent effect uh, but we will find out in years yeah we still that's, need time uh, exactly so um there is there is no 100% certainty on on whether um the when it's used in uh, when it's a spread they use in, in 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 the farming sector, whether the rumen environment will develop uh, alternatives to deal with those uh, mm -hmm. inhibitors, um, there's no guarantee. No guarantees. But do we know how these add additives are metabolized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the. Um, in Europe, uh, we uh, the legislation and the and the EFSA guidelines are very strict in 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 how uh, the 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 dossier and the application of to be an additive has to be presented and some of them is to prove uh how, or to show the mode of action and whether uh it it is metabolized in the digestive system and whether it is excreted in urine or feces uh, and also if it is transferred to milk and meat so in, in terms of uh, three nop it's been proven that it is metabolized in the rumen so there is no transfer to any any tissue uh, and in the in in the case of uh, asparagopsis, uh, there's still a debate. Uh, bromoform is very quickly degraded in the rumen, but there are secondary metabolites that can be potentially transferred to milk and meat, and uh, and they could be toxic, but depending on the level of dosage that you use in the animals. Uh, I think at the levels of uh, sensible uh, use, there's no risk, but that has to be still um, evaluated. Exactly. Yeah. The last question, a yes or no uh, answer. Are you developing any, any work with asparagopsis? Yes. Yes. Okay. We'll <laughs> um, need more. Yeah, that. in vitro and in vivo. Anyone who wants to, uh, you know, get more information on that, uh, very happy to uh, provide more details. Fantastic. We have still plenty of questions here, and thank you so much for the audience for taking part. We'll try to, you know, if not, don't address them right now, uh, at, at least having our speakers, you know, providing a, a written answer that we'll share later. So thank yeah. you so much, David. We we now looking forward to, to hear Coralia. Coralia is still here with us. Let's ask Coralia to jump into the floor. There she is. Coralia, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today uh, to this webinar. Uh, I will uh, talk about, uh, well, that breeding for uh, feed efficient and uh, low methane uh, emitting animals or uh, dairy cows is, uh, is feasible. And um, thank you, David, because he already gave like a overview of what is happening inside the, 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 the cow. Then I don't need to spend so much time in this slide. Well, uh, the only thing I will say is that uh, as we have here, uh, methane is mainly uh, produced uh, by porps at 95 percent and is due to the uh, um, this process of the uh, when the microbiomes are uh, uh, decompositing uh, the 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 the, uh, the grass to convert it in energy, and there is like this subproduct. Um, also, uh, thank you to the, the, that we have this uh, presentation before, and then uh, these slides where they mention what is the percent total percentage of livestock that, that is contributing um, to the greenhouse uh, gases. 
and it is a uh, 14%. And from that, uh, the 44% is uh, due to the enteric fermentation. That is the what uh, I'm going to be uh, talking today. Uh, it can be called enteric methane or methane emissions, or uh, in uh, animal breeding, we call it uh, methane production. But why is it important? Well, we have also heard that there is this uh, um, agreement that among countries, more than 100 countries, and they have agreed to reduce by at least 55% of the greenhouse gases emissions by uh, 2030 and to reach a climate neutrality by 2050. And in order to achieve that, we need to um, uh, maybe not select one strategy, but combine several strategies uh, to, 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 to achieve that reduction. And I will talk about today uh, what is uh, from uh, the point of view of the uh, genetics. Uh, why uh, genetic is an alternative for, uh, to reduce uh, methane? Well, we have done it with other traits. And uh, is um, the main advantage is that it's cumulative over generation. That means that uh, we can uh, select for uh, one generation that is producing uh, less methane, and then the next generation will be producing less methane, and then we keep selecting, and then we can see that we can achieve that in the future. It's also permanent. Uh, if we keep that selection, it's not like we are going to uh, come back in 10 years. If, if we have 10 years of selection, we won't come back to the to the previous uh, uh, amount of methane that was produced and uh, that make it uh, effective and sustainable. Um, because I also didn't know about the background of everybody, I will just talk uh, briefly about what is uh, what we do in genetics. It's not that we are modifying the DNA of the animal, but we are just uh, taking advantage of those differences in among the animals. We have uh, different animals, and those animals, they will produce a different, for example, amount of milk. Some of the animals will produce more milk. Some of the animals, they will produce less milk, but also those animals, some animals, they will produce more methane and some animals, they will produce less methane. And our idea is to uh, find or select and identify those animals that they are producing less methane, but with a comparable amount of milk. That means that in the future, we can reduce methane without affecting the, the milk production. And that's what uh, mainly genetic does. Uh, they, they, we have uh, those uh, differences among animals, and those differences are mainly uh, due to two factors, that is the genetics and the permanent environment. And in this environment, uh, it can be, for example, the diet, uh, the source uh, of the uh, of, of, of the uh, or the quality of the diet, as uh, David was talking. Also, can be the hair, the management. There are several factors. But for us, it's interesting to identify what of that percentage of this variation is due to genetics, and then we can um, identify those animals as select those animals. Um, I will uh, discuss what is uh, uh, published in one of the uh, latest articles that we um, uh, have uh, published. And in this uh, uh, work, uh, there were mainly two objectives. Uh, one of the objectives was to identify um, which ones will be the, the, the best uh, uh, methane traits and estimate the genetic parameters of those, uh, of those traits. And the second objective will be evaluate this uh, correlated response of the methane trace compared to other traits like feed efficiency or uh, production. Um, briefly, uh, the data description, it was uh, the, we measure uh, methane emissions for seven years in a the research farm of a, a, in the, the or from Aarhus University in Denmark. And we had about uh, 650 uh, cows. We got more than 20,000 uh, weekly methane records of those cows uh, among the different parities. Those animals, they are uh, from different lactations, from one to six. And we also have other records like the uh, intake of the animal, that is called uh, dry mare intake, the uh, pro milk production, that is energy corrected milk, and the uh, body weight of those animals. 
with those uh, traits, we were able to calculate what is uh, we call feed efficiency. And also we had uh, for this study a uh, pedigree of those animals, like what were the, 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 the dams and the sires and the grand sires and the grand dams of those animals up to 12,000 of uh, animals uh, of pedigree. We have um, our main trait of methane. Uh, we measure methane by sniffers and the uh, trait that they uh, that we get from this uh, uh, method of measuring methane is uh, called methane concentration. Is uh, the unity is in parts per million, and we have a formula that to calculate from methane concentration we can calculate the methane production that will be in grams of methane per day per animal. We also uh, have other traits, suggested traits that is like um, we call it adjusted traits. Uh, uh, part, um, mainly is like the methane production and the methane concentration, but adjusted by the weight of the animal and the uh, meal production of the animal. And then we can see um, which animals they are more efficient than the other animals in terms of methane, because due to this uh, milk and this weight, they should produce this amount of methane, but if they produce less than that, we know those animals, they are more efficient in terms of methane. We have also other uh, methane traits that they are called methane intensity. That is the amount of methane divided by a uh, milk production or energy corrected milk and methane yield. That is the methane divided by uh, kilograms of uh, feed intake. Uh, our model included a uh, fixed effects that they were uh, the experiment, year and season. Let's try to uh, correct for all, or take into account everything that is uh, not uh, genetic. Then the lactation week, what is uh, uh, at the moment of the, that we take the record of methane and what parity of the animal and the age of the cow at the moment of calving. And then all we have here is the genetic effect, the permanent environment effect, and well, the error. Uh, our results are showing that all the all the five uh, all the six methane traits that we uh, study, they are having heritabilities between uh, 0.16 to 0.23. That is considered a moderate heritability. This, that means that the 20% of this variation that we see is due to a genetic factor. And also we see the correlations among the traits or among the methane traits is uh, relatively high for some of them, about 0.7. Some of them, they are really high, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and some of them, they are less uh, correlated. But in general, they are highly correlated. Um, then we see the correlations between a, a residual feed intake is what is our trait that they, um, is considered uh, the proxy for feed efficiency. And then we see the correlations between methane production and uh, feed efficiency. They have two definitions of feed efficiency. They are is highly correlated with methane. And then we see the correlation with the other methane traits, but methane production is the one that is uh, more uh, correlated with uh, feed efficiency. This correlation means that we can select in the same direction. We can select for animals that they are more efficient, but at the same time, they are producing less methane. And uh, we have uh, an exercise where we select, we have several scenarios. What happens if we don't uh, change anything? That's our scenario zero. Um, and then we have a scenario uh, one, that is we are having a, a negative value for uh, feed efficiency. That means that we are uh, uh, trying to um, uh, penalize the animals that they are not so efficient. And then we have also scenarios where we are also putting some weight to select for animals that they are uh, the, uh, for, for the methane part of this, uh, uh, for the methane production of the animal. And then based on those scenarios, we have that they, we can get, have a, a genetic uh, gain or a, or a correlated response uh, for, for example, for milk, uh, methane uh, production, that it can 
we can achieve a reduction. This is the scenario, the base scenario that is 24.22 uh, 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 grams of methane production uh, per day per animal per day, and then we can reduce it up to 20 grams. Uh, and then we have it uh, for uh, the other traits that it also, uh, in this case, we 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 want that is also uh, that is negative uh, that we are selecting for animals that they are producing less methane than the expected. And then we have this uh, also this methane intensity that is also negative. The methane intensity usually is negative uh, for, uh, for example, a uh, breed that is hosted because they are highly producing animals. They are producing, when they, you divide the amount of methane they are producing by the amount of milk they are producing, they are already uh, quite efficient animals compared to other uh, breeds, for example. Based on these uh, results, we can, um, this is uh, what will be the estimated reduction in the methane production if we select for uh, methane uh, or less uh, uh, methane emitting animals. And then we see that uh, in 10 years, we could achieve a 7% of reduction on this methane production. This is the compared to 2023. 20, uh, uh, in 2040, we could uh, achieve a 17% uh, of reduction. And in 2050, we could achieve a 28% of reduction if we select for uh, for low uh, methane emitting animals. Well, uh, then the take home messages are is that it is possible to improve and select for uh, feed efficiency and reduce methane at the same time in dairy cattle. And it is also possible to reduce methane emission without to compromise meal production. Uh, also, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention, and this is uh, also what is my uh, working group in the part of uh, feed efficiency and methane emissions in uh, QGG, the Center for Quantitative Genetics and Genetic Genomics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Corelia, also for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and now, uh, while I was hearing your, your presentation, uh, just one question came to my mind. So you strongly argue for genetic uh, um, selection so that we can have more, more efficient animals in terms of met 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 methane uh, production. I have here two questions. Can you really explain how this ep happens in, in practice? Also, because we know that uh, um, there are several limitations in terms of measuring methane in vivo. You mentioned that you measure methane with, with uh, uh, sniffers, uh, but there are several studies refer to other methodologies, and this might also come into play with your results. So how do you do, first of all, uh, genetic slash selection in practice, and what are the measures that you use to measure methane? Yeah, uh, you are totally right. Uh, in order to um, to be able to predict methane or to select for the uh, future animals that they will produce less methane, we need to record a large number of uh, animals. Currently in Denmark, we are we have about seven thousand uh, of uh, cows with methane records, and suddenly we were all. all soon we will have uh, 10,000 of animals with methane records. Then we can uh, predict for the future animals what will be well, based on those ones, based on those records that we already have, and based on this pedigree and, gen and genomics, we will be able to say what, how is going to be, for example, an animal that is just born, and we have the, the uh, we have the DNA or the pedigree of an animal, we will be able to link it with the other, other animals and we can say how this animal will be uh, in terms of methane production. But uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a requirement that we will need to have a large amount of animals. But also there are good news, there are uh, several initiatives now we are in Denmark, we are part of a, a consortium that is sharing data across countries, and there are several countries, like for example, is, uh, there is uh, Canada, there is Spain, there is uh, uh, Australia, the uh, US, that they start to uh, record uh, sometimes with different methods. And then we start to share uh, these, uh, those phenotypes. 
And then we can, because all those animals, we can link it through the pedigree or through the genomics, and then we can build a, slowly a, a big uh, reference population with methane records. I hope okay. that they solved your yes, questions. <laughs> that's that's interesting. So at the moment, this kind of database of genetics from animals is still pretty much part of research groups. So it's not fully commercial, commercially available to, to farmers? No, uh, at this moment is uh, mainly, as you just say, it mainly they are uh, universities and uh, research institutions that they are recording because, well, the, the, it's quite uh, costly to record methane by different, uh, all the different uh, technologies available. And But the idea is that in the future, we can share all the countries that they are uh, recording methane, we can share uh, uh, the, those phenotypes, and then we can uh, help each other to, to build this uh, database and try to uh, predict what will be our own animals and what will be the methane uh, production of, of our own animals. Okay, very good. Thank you, Corella. I just wonder if we have questions from our audience. We still have one two minutes to to ask a couple of questions. Uh, <laughs> the first question is um, a very interesting one, but 55% uh, uh, of greenhouse emission reduction for by 2030 is a lot. Is there a magic formula? I think this was something that <laughs> the United, the European Union has established and is counting with all of us to, to ensure that we reach this target. Do you want to add something from your, your, your studies on, uh, you, you actually yeah. put some numbers up. Yeah, well, as I just mentioned before, and I think also David mentioned it, I, I don't think there is a, a quick solution or an easy solution or a unique solution. I think for this, uh, if we want to achieve this reduction, we need to combine uh, efforts or combine strategies. And that means that maybe we will use animals that they are already um, uh, genetically going to uh, produce less methane, but also we will put maybe an, a diet also to reduce it even more. And then also a bit of management and we will keep those animals longer in 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 production to, to to help with this uh, dilution of the methane in one cow instead of uh, several cows. Yeah, I think there is a, a lot to do. And there, there are also some strategies that they, we, they, they are still not published. They still uh, <laughs> been in the lab or in uh, some research group. Yeah, thank you. Um, one well, other question more, more related to, to, to your presentation. So you, you have uh, addressed the, 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 the question of feed, feed, feed efficiency and also methane, methane uh, traits used in the, in the production. Have you accounted for any negative um, economic value for methane in terms of making your case stronger? So have you factored in any economics? Yes, uh, well, um, that was based on some information that is, uh, that is uh, some statistics that they are public in Denmark and uh, is it in the, in the paper, but um, we did account for, we, we, we assign a negative value based on what is the cost in, in crowns and in euros uh, of uh, one ton of a, uh, of CO2 and then we convert it to the equivalent uh, of for methane and then we develop that uh, economic value in that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're just reaching the, the end of our uh, webinar. Thank you, Corelia, for your great presentation and explanation. May I just turn to, to David, still a couple of questions before I, I just close with uh, um, Sylvia, you just, took off the, <laughs> the questions from, thank you. So it's, it's a question that uh, relates to the results of three NOP. How will they be used in practice? So what are the recommended amounts? Do they work on the, on the same way on the farm? So we are assuming that this is pretty much on uh, the lab uh, level. Do you have any, any idea? How yes, yeah. Uh, well, the, um, the three NOP has been uh, proved in, I've been tested in vitro and then in respirometry chambers and then in, in, in real farming conditions uh, using green feed. Uh, and um, 
and the level of reduction uh, at the dosage level that is recommended uh, has been consistent. So it's around 30% reduction and, uh, and the level of inclusion, of, I think the commercial recommended dose is 60 milligrams uh, per kilogram of, uh, of dry matter. So that's, um, so that's, uh, yeah, 60, 60, mil, uh, P, uh, 60 ppm uh, level of inclusion. So if we multiply 60 milligrams per 25 kilos is one and a half gram of um, uh, 3 NOP uh, for a uh, dairy cow uh, for a day. Okay, so yeah, we already basically, have... basically mixed with the concentrate. Okay, so we already have an idea of, uh, you know, the doses has been tested, so it's almost, uh, uh, farmers can use it uh, yeah, with yeah, some the, confidence. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's not a product, uh, um, I'm not working for the company, but I've been involved in some of the tests, but uh, it's uh, one of the guarantees we have in the European Union compared to other regions in, in the world is that uh, we, um, uh, the regulation uh, are quite strict. So once something gets in the market, obviously 100% security cannot be always uh, provided, but the level of security, not only in terms of toxicology, etc., but also the effectiveness is, is quite high, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. I have two final questions for both of you since Seida had to leave. Um, and one of them uh, relates to the new common agriculture policy. This is a hot topic. You know, we have the, the new PEPAC just coming in, into place. So the question is, uh, from your work and from your knowledge of the, the, the sector, um, would the financial support be more significant and would it be easier to implement, for example, part of your strategies that you have been suggesting through your work um, through uh, the eco schemes, for example? So all the incentives that the, the common agriculture policy is giving towards more sustainable produ production? I, well, if I can start, uh, I think for the feeding strategies, um, I, I don't think any measure in place now that can that be directly implemented or supported uh, to reduce uh, methane production because there are maybe other priorities in terms of uh, um, ecosystem services and, and making sure that we use the um, um, the resources uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. But yeah, I can see that in the in the future, um, maybe some measures to be applied. But this is quite controversial because uh, they can put some uh, um, benefits of some private companies, for instance. And then, you know, how you mix public subsidies with interests of private companies is um, is a hot topic. And, and I don't think there is an easy answer for that. OK, thank you. That's always a, a big question to balance and all the trade offs that have to be made uh, when uh, when deciding policies and making sure that we really have the broad picture to, to make sure that the policy is going in the right direction. Corelia, would you like to add something on this? I think uh, uh, from the size of, uh, side of genetics, we're still also far from implementation and it has something to do with uh, maybe it's not uh, so easy the traceability uh, and yeah, uh, but uh, I think I think in the future it, it will need uh, um, somehow to identify which ones are the I don't know like in the final product if this product is coming from a hair hair or something that it has a um, cows that they produce less methane. But yeah, I, I think it's still a long uh, way to go to be able to to do that and uh, yeah to talk yeah, about but... implementation. Yes, you're, you're definitely right and goes back to traceability and how can consumers be sure that what they are eating is actually what they think they are, they are eating. It's also a very important uh, aspect for sure. Um, so one final question, if you allow me. Uh, we all know that agriculture is highly dependent on the climate. The climbing has been suffering a lot in terms of distribution of precipitation and temperatures and the combination of these two factors. So in the context of the work that you've been doing and been developing, what is your perspective on uh, uh, ruminant production given such an uncertain scenario? Now, how do you think livestock production 
can be more resilient and adapted to all the, the challenges that the climate is posing at us. I'm very, I have to say, I'm very pessimistic about this, to be honest, um, because climate change is not something that uh, will come, it's something that we already have with us. And uh, obviously in some regions, might be more obvious than others. I live in South Spain and I can tell you the uh, ruminant production systems are suffering from the uh, reduction in precipitation, uh, lack of uh, good conditions to produce forage. So I think uh, if um, if the sector look in, in the medium long term, uh, I think some drastic changes uh, need to be applied um, in order to make the, the whole sector sustainable. And, and obviously there's not a single solution, but some systems might have to be reallocated from some regions to others. Some might have to disappear um, because it's, it's not going to be longer possible to uh, grow animals in, in those conditions. And, and then, yeah, of course, uh, feeding strategies, breathing strategies to deal with uh, heat stress uh, events and things like that, I think will become even uh, more, more important. Thank you. It, I it's, hope it's, we... it's a very, it's a very complex uh, issue, but um, issue. but definitely things are changing very quickly. Yeah, I just hope that uh, our future ge generations don't forget the taste of a good beef uh, from extensive grazing and from good forage. I hope that we will we'll find a solution by then. Coralia, what's your views on this? Yeah, as uh, David mentioned, I think it, it depends a lot the region. Uh, but uh, well, I, I can say in in, in Denmark, uh, we we still don't have that much of a problem. Uh, but uh, in general, in genetics, there are already groups that they are working uh, with traits that they are uh, heat tolerance, uh, resilience, uh, all those uh, type of traits to identify how we can uh, select for a animal that adapt better to those. Um, future uh, challenges. Yes, and we'll probably need to import some some breeds from other regions and, uh, yeah. you know, and forego some our, our more autochthonous uh, breeds. Let's see. Well, our time has arrived. I have to say it was a real pleasure for my end to be here moderating these conversations. I really want to thank you for taking part in this, in this webinar. Thank you so much to the audience and for all your great questions that you have posed. Um, let me just tell you that we will continue with this series. Next week, we'll try to address the topic or, on the role of livestock to produce, you know, climate neutral regenerative agriculture systems. I ask everyone to join us next week, same day, same time. We'll be here for a very interesting discussion again. Thank you so much. See you next week. Bye. Thank you.